It's the constant flow of now, it's so wonderful, I don't know how. What's up everyone? Welcome to my channel if you're new, welcome back if you've been here before. Today is a very special day because I am actually interviewing my teacher, Grandmaster Wolf. And in order to take advantage of the full hour in the interview with him, I did make him talk about how he got to the point where he is right now. Because not only are there dozens of interviews with him out there on his channel and on other people's channels, but I also thought I can do a little introduction about him as well. First of all, maybe I should mention how I found Grandmaster Wolf, which was originally from the videos of Oliver on the Matrix Wissen YouTube channel, which I'm gonna link the most important videos below into the description. In my opinion, these were the best interviews because Oliver, who unfortunately passed away, used to challenge Grandmaster Wolf to the most amazing amazing experiments. I think the main reason why GM Wolf has gotten somewhat famous is not only because of the wisdom bombs that he drops all the time, but also because of his telekinetic abilities. But despite all of the amazing experiments that Oliver did with GM, I was still somewhat skeptical until I saw this video. The experiments you're about to see with GM, the distance was about 1,500 kilometers since GM was in Sweden, while I and my random number generator were in Germany. Normally, the output of the random number generator oscillates around the zero line. The task in the experiment is to use the power of your mind to make the output either go above or below the average, depending on the task. We'll try and go up first. Hang on. So, yeah. did you do anything different in the first half contrary to the second half? Yes, I did something in the first half and then uh, it finished. I'm not going to tell you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem, no problem. You can, you can have your secrets. Let's try down. You're sure? Okay. Yeah. Well, that works. Okay, I need to work on that particular thought. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And ever since then, I watched all of the interviews with him and eventually I got in contact with him and I'm now his student, which is so incredible and which was a wish that I had ever since my childhood. To talk to somebody that can maybe understand what I'm experiencing. If you know my series Mysterious Incidents is story time, you know that I've always experienced somewhat mystical things ever since my childhood. And one of the things was that I knew that I will meet somebody like him in order to get the help that I need in this lifetime and maybe clarify what can I do with all this stuff, right? So here a little introduction about Grandmaster Wolf, where he's coming from, who is he, how did he learn all these abilities, and why is everybody trying to talk to him? Basically, GM Wolf came from a really abusive upbringing. He then obviously never wanted to be at home and then after school went to the police boys club. He then told a friend what was going on, who then told his father what was going on with GM. His father was a surgeon at the local police force, who then introduced GM to a Chinese Kung Fu master. Kung Fu, <laughs> can't say it right. This master then called GM's parents and said, hey, we can take him on. This master then handed him over to his father. And after a while of the master training GM, he basically said, you're too broken inside, we can't continue. He then put a little letter of recommendation or introduction into a silver tube, handed it over to a GM Wolf and sent him off to Tibet. And to skip all the parts that happened between, he ended up becoming a full-time monk when he was only 14 years old. He was then there for 18 years. That's the short version of how and where he learned all of these abilities, which we call abilities, which I think he would say a natural consequence of controlling the mind. I'm guessing, sorry GM if I said it wrong. <laughs> but again, if you wanna hear about all this stuff more in detail, just watch the interviews that I linked below or all the other interviews that you can find. There's always incredible information about him and all the other stuff in there. So without further ado, let's get into this amazing interview. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Good to see you, GM. 
And you, and you. I've been looking forward to this, actually. Me too. Here we are with GM Wolf, Grandmaster Wolf. What an honor that I can interview you with all these questions. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So my first question already is about something that I'm always trying to, or I should say have a hard time with explaining in words, which is about the state of being in the now. So when I get into the state of being in the now, then everything looks very magical, almost like plasticky. This is where I have a hard time with the words. It has this like plasticky view to it, or it's almost like I'm on some type of drugs or something. And I wanted to ask you if you can speak on that and maybe explain what that is about or, yes. Can you say something to that? Let me just clarify. (laughs) (laughs) You want me to clarify on how to stay in the moment or why your perception changes? Yes, why the perception changes. That would be really interesting to know. Okay, easy. If you're truly in the moment, now uh, let me back up a little bit. Any thought process that you have, any thinking that you do comes from your past. It comes from from your memory. Just knowing what a word is comes from your memory, obviously. If you're in the moment, it means you're not in the past, which means you're not using your memory. And therefore, everything you perceive in the moment isn't being analyzed and delineated and labeled and many, many other things that your brain will attach to your perceptions, that's not happening because you're not using the past. You're just in the moment. People think being in the moment is just sitting down, looking at the beautiful countryside, looking at the ocean and the waves, thinking wonderful things. That's not being in the moment. Thinking wonderful things just took you into the past. Mm -hmm. But once again, like I said, if you are truly in the moment, you are, there is no room for the past. So if you're truly in the moment, you don't know what you're looking at because your brain isn't bringing up memories. It's not bringing up labels. You are at that point looking into what's called the void. You're seeing everything that everyone else sees, but it is void of meaning, void of, an analogy, an uh, <laughs> analysis, um, void of meaning, and therefore your brain is your your perception scrambles to try and fit it into something. So it'll look plasticky. It'll look like it's moving. It'll look wobbly. Your brain's trying to fit it in somewhere mm-hmm. because it's not bringing up categories because you're not using the past. You, your brain can't put what you're looking at into a category. The beautiful thing, though, is if you can just stick with it, eventually your brain will give up Mm -hmm. doing that. And when it stops doing that, you start to live in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's very different from that point on. Mm -hmm. So it's a normal thing that this happens. There's not something. Yeah. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. This is uh, really. Everything is normal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Otherwise, it wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true because sometimes, you know, I'm just wondering because we can tell ourselves all sorts of things, right? Like, you know, I could tell myself, wow, I'm experiencing something super magical and I'm just, you know, basically, let's say hallucinating that this is really happening, you know? So this is why it's really beautiful to talk to somebody like you. And I'm also asking this question because I really wish that, you know, the people that I speak to that are talking about being in the now that they can understand what I'm really talking about and how magical it actually is, right? I always wish to share this with everybody and I can never put it in words. And just like you said, it's always like, oh yeah, being in the now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so beautiful right now. Oh, I'm not (laughs) thinking about it tomorrow, how beautiful it was yesterday. Yes, it's being in the now, but it goes so much deeper. So that's really interesting. If, If I can manage to just let's say ignore that this is happening and just let it pass then it's going to get even more magical absolutely Ooh, be amazed this at is great from there. yeah mm-hmm. when you can i ask you a question real quick yes of course please when you say uh 
we see something quite magical in the moment and we and and i say to myself or we say to ourselves when you say that who is the self that you're talking to and who is the my exactly yeah that is saying it owns that self you see mm -hmm. we don't listen to what we say i'm not talking about you here this is just mm -hmm. interesting when you say myself mm -hmm. You're saying it, not just you. We say it in such a way as in this is my cup, this is my car, this is my house, this is mm -hmm. myself, this is my ball. You know, where does that attitude come from? Mm -hmm. So we all know and we say a thousand times a day that we own this self. This is myself, this is my car, myself, this car. Who is in there saying that about myself? Who is it that believes they own this self? Yeah. This I is a good thing to look into. It's a very good thing to look into because it forces you to ask the question, when I am watching myself, myself, who am I in here watching that self? Mm -hmm. Don't wait for the self to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> very true. And that brings me to something I was going to ask later, but this totally fits you right now. Your exercise has really helped with that. The exercise where you explain to count in with your inner audible voice and then watch where you are creating the thought and how you're creating it. And that creates a really beautiful separation between, yeah. let's call it the true self for lack of better words, mm -hmm. and the ego. And that's really, really a great exercise. The first time I did it, I was like, wow, what the heck? This is so amazing. It's really, really, really awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, so my next question is about manifestation. <clears throat> so you've probably already seen that since many, many years, uh, this has been a big topic, right? Before I was born, even Neville Goddard and all these people, and that we obviously have power. Our thoughts have some type of influence on our reality, right? And for example, in my case, when I really noticed how powerful that is, I started a, an experiment, which I wanted to do just for one year, which then turned into two years and now is still going on. And this was in 2000. 13 or 12 and I started recording I really did it like an experiment with like recording myself and mm -hmm. talking about it and seeing if I can attract things into my life and maybe you can explain a little bit more on that from a point of view like yours like from a real master instead of you know us reading all these books and we're just on the surface level of oh yeah if I think positive all these positive things are happening I know from my life that I can attract anything that I want. It has been proven into my life, other than if I have doubts. Uh, and I even know how to get rid of the doubts. So I know that it really, really works. But maybe you can explain us something about this because it seems to be a big topic and everybody wants to know about that. And people really, uh, it would be very helpful for people also to understand what, what their thoughts are actually creating and what's happening. Okay. Just before I answer that, what do you do to manifest something? So what I usually do is, first of all, I notice that when I just am what I want to attract, it just happens. But when I notice that I am not that and I want to break a pattern or something is in my life that I don't like, I already know I attracted it, right? So I want to change it. What, then what I do is what I call the happiness dance. Because I know uh, that I just have to create the feeling of something. And I really work myself up into it like a child. I love that anyways. This is yeah. so much fun. I love doing this every day. And I just really imagine and feel how it would be like to have what I want. And yes. whatever that is. And it's it becomes less and less something uh, ridiculous. Let's call it like that. It's usually things that I really need in my life. It, like for let's say to pay the rent or whatever like that and I noticed <laughs> ooh, my fears or my blockages created some stallment there and then I I just switch it around I do my happiness dance and I really work myself up into it and I try to do at least 70 seconds because of what I know about how the mind works but then if I can I do as long as I can and I just go go for it go for it and then I just think I'm just happy waiting for it where it comes from 
And then I'm always like, okay, I can't wait to see where it comes from. And then also a big part for me is to follow the instincts because then later it's almost like, oh, this way, okay, this way. And then boom, all of a sudden it comes from somewhere where you would least expect it. That's if I let go of the how, if I let go of how and where it should come from, it really comes in really fast. Yeah, yeah. Other than if I have a blockage. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Have you heard the story about my one of my students who manifested a fish tank and it happened within seconds? No. no. I was afraid that you're going to talk about the lady that manifested 60,000 and then unfortunately it had a, another. Her grandmother died and left her yeah. the money. Yeah. Yes. No, no. I, I materialized something too one day with a witness. I never managed yeah. to do this again, but I really, yes, please tell me the story with the fish tank. Holy moly, this is amazing. Yeah. Okay, going to do a little bit of time jumping as we go along very, very please. quickly. This isn't an answer to your question, but it's, an, uh, it, it, it's in line with what you were just talking about yourself. I think this is the first interview I've ever had with a student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You should <laughs> By the way, you're a damn good student. You you blow me out, some of the things you come out with. Okay, here's what happened. Um, I had a student many, many years ago. Her name was Ishtar. She would know who she is. And she'd been with me for four or five years, and it was time for her to do an exam in magical manifestation. Generally speaking, you get up to 28 days for your manifestation to occur in an exam situation because if your manifestation is good, it will always happen within 28 days, which is a moon cycle, mm -hmm. but not strictly that amount of time. It can happen immediately depending on how good you are and what angels are around at the time. That being said, she started a ritual. We did the circle. She invoked the, the appropriate states of mind that was necessary. She did all of the motions and everything else. And just before the end of her practice, there was this almighty crash on the front door and the window pane on the front door smashed. That wasn't the sound, though. So oh. this is where we're going to jump back in time a little bit. When we first started, we didn't know this till we looked into it later. When we first started the ritual or when she started the ritual, at that same moment in a neighbouring um, district, what would you call neighbourhood, in a neighbouring neighbourhood, someone was moving house. They had arranged for two guys to come in a truck and pack all their stuff onto this truck and move them to their new home. The driver had gone to the toilet. The person who was tying everything down on the back of the truck didn't finish tying everything down and got distracted and went off to another area. The guy that came out of the toilet, the driver, assumed everything had been tied down. This is around the same time we started our ritual. Mm -hmm. So this is how magic works, and this is why it worked immediately. Mm -hmm. The driver gets in his truck. He starts driving towards the new home. By the time he'd gotten to very close to where we were, we were almost at the end of the ritual. Just as the ritual was finishing, he drove his truck around the corner way too fast and a six-foot glass fish tank flew off the back of the truck and smashed onto our front doorstep. <laughs> I opened the door and I went, wow, well, pretty good. That's a pass. Look <laughs> <laughs> oh. how quickly it can happen depending on where the appropriate angels are. And when I say angels, I'm not talking about wings and things. I'm talking about if anyone does a ritual and they start, or if anyone is just focusing on something that they need into their life, as soon as you start visualizing your brain immediately starts pulling people into your life that is going to work with you and help you attain your manifestation immediately. Mm -hmm. So as soon as this ritual was happening, the intent had gone out into the ether and life 
immediately went, oh, there's a fish tank, there's a guy. All I've got to do is stop, is distract that one, and the fish tank will end up there. And that's what happened. So that was mm -hmm. easy. If the fish tank had been, you know, several hundred miles away or something of that nature, it would have taken a bit longer. The fish tank would have ended up being on a train or, in a, you know, it would have been a different story. But it would have got there within 28 days. Mm -hmm. So that's how instant it can be. Now, to get back to your question, one of the most famous um, Western Kabbalists and manifestors in the magical history is a lady called Dion Fortune, and she was an expert at the Kabbalah, turning Kabbalah into Western terminology. Mm -hmm. And one of her famous sayings was, if you can have something in your mind and hold it still long enough, you will eventually have it in your hand. And that basically just means focus on one thing and nothing else and it will arrive. Mm -hmm. Don't doubt it. It's like a, if you call up the local shop and say, I need a loaf of bread and two cartons of milk, uh, can you have it delivered? And the guy on the other end says, yeah, it'll be there in half an hour. You're going to go about your business. You're not going to worry about it. You know it's going to arrive. You're not even going to think about it. In yeah. fact, when the delivery knocks at the door, you'll go, oh, that's right, I've ordered some food. Mm -hmm. That's how it should be with your magic. You should have enough confidence, visualise it, I need it, I need it here, ASAP, you let it go and go about your business and then just mm -hmm. watch how quickly it arrives. Yeah. yeah. That, that's um, everyday layperson magic and it works beautifully and it works wonderfully and it's very, very, um, very, very useful. Mm -hmm. If you want to get specifics, if you want the person that brings it to you to have blue eyes, if you want it to arrive on a Wednesday afternoon specifically, yeah. if you want it to arrive at 5.30 just in time for someone's birthday party, then you have to do magical ritual. Okay. Mm -hmm. That way you fine tune, you tweak it, get it down to a time, colour, size. You can go that deep with it. You can get it that perfect mm -hmm. if you want to. But, you know. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. Way. The fish tank story, I can totally relate to this because when I started these experiments, these things would always happen. It was always yeah. in my mind how these things then all of a sudden would be there. Then I started questioning, did I see it beforehand? And this is why I started manifesting this or, you know, these type of things. Also, uh, you just reminded me of something. When I was a teenager, as we already spoke about uh, when we were alone, that... Um, when we're younger, the powers are still stronger, right? And it kind of goes away. Yeah. To bring it back. I used to have this gift or power. Nobody would understand what I'm talking about. And I thought everybody could do it. The things that happened to me as a child, I thought everybody could do it. And then later I learned, oh, hold on, something is different here. Yeah. But I would be able to, how am I explaining this? Shorten time when I wanted to arrive somewhere. And I can't even yeah. explain in words how I did that, but I just knew I'm getting there fast. I can't really explain it in words. I just knew I can get there faster because I used to wake up five minutes before I had to go to work. <laughs> and then I just was like, oh, and I was so sleepy because I'm a night owl and I was always awake really long and I was so sleepy. And I just knew I'm getting there fast. It didn't matter if I'm on foot or in, in the car. And the beginning was so normal to me. And then later I noticed hold on, that doesn't even make no sense that I arrived mm -hmm. so early within minutes when the, the drive, for example, takes 10 minutes in, re in reality and I'm there in three and it can't even be, I was even surprised when I noticed it and then I thought everybody could do it, but they can't. And my other um, materialization story uh, was materialization, I don't even know how you say that, it was <laughs> <laughs> losing the words. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was with a friend of mine, a little bit of a crazy person I had to cut out of my life, but I had a little pouch where I had like small makeup things. I don't use a lot of makeup, like small things. And I thought I had a tampon in there. And my cycle started and I said, oh my God, I, I, I think I have one in there. And then I looked and there was no one. And in that time, I also had a lot of power. I don't know, there's sometimes phases where it gets stronger. And I was like, no, I know there is one there. And he was there. He witnessed it. It's not like you have to dig in that small little pouch. You don't have to dig in there. 
uh, I said, but there is one there, but there is one there. And it was so bizarre because it looked like a magic trick. It came out of my hand like that. It was so bizarre. I said, it must be there. And he was like, it's not there. I can see. What are you looking for? I said, no, there is one. There is one. There is one. So it went maybe for like two minutes. And he thought I lost my mind because how long are you going to look for that tampon? And bloop, it just plopped out. And he witnessed a lot of things like that. He started screaming. He said, you are a witch. He would always say, you're a witch. <laughs> how did you do that? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like that. So it's really, really magical. But I couldn't make it happen again. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it happen again. But that brings me to the next story. So I often have dreams, and again, in phases, sometimes more, sometimes less, dreams that would happen in real life. And not even something where I can foresee somebody's unfortunate or whatever, not, nothing like this, just regular things that come back as deja vus. And when I was a child, I actually asked my dad, I said, Dad, I dreamt this before. And he explained something to me about deja vus have nothing to do with dreams. And I believed it until I had my very first boyfriend and I woke up in the morning and I kept telling him my dreams, which is why I then really remembered them. And then they would happen, just really random things, random situations. They would just really happen just exactly how I dreamt, like the city, for example, here on Tenerife, I dreamt from the city six months before I came here all the time. I was like, what is this weird city? Like, why is the water right there? And I keep always thinking, that's so bizarre. That can't be one of those dreams <laughs> that come uh, into, that become reality. But slowly, I already know the feeling of those dreams. So it gets better. But I was always wondering, did I manifest it because I dreamt it? Or do I dream it as a foresight type of thing? I don't know if that's something you can answer, but it uh, has been a big question ever right. since childhood. Both are possible. Mm -hmm. You know, one is prediction. One, well, one is seeing into the future, so-called. One is seeing into the past, so-called. Um, it's always a question when you manifest something or... If you think about something and it happens, the question is always there. Did that happen because I thought about it or did I think about it because I knew it was going to happen? Yeah. Both happen all the time. But you have to have a very clear understanding about time for that and why and how that works. Um, I'll give you a very quick, for instance, of what I mean by that. Uh, as One of... One of the scientists that is involved in some experimentations and things that I'm talking to and working with um, related an experiment that they did to me. And the experiment was they got a bunch of people in a room and they had another bunch of people. Hang on, how do they do this? They had a laser beam. Mm -hmm. And they got a bunch of people to focus on this laser beam and to try and, I think it was a laser beam, it's irrelevant, to try and um, manipulate and redirect the laser beam or at least some particle, light particles. So they got these people to focus. The machine was in another room and they were recording it. The people focused on it and sure enough, they affected the laser beam. Um scientifically reproduced the experiment over and over and got the same outcome not a problem at all so that's affecting something with the mind that's a scientific demonstration that it happens there's mm -hmm. no two wow. ways about it. Mm -hmm. so then they got a different bunch of people who don't know anything about what just happened and they had them in a room and they had the experiment in the other room the same experiment but they played the recording of the previous experiment to these new people. Mm -hmm. These new people thought it was a real experiment. They thought the machine was in the other room and they were trying to manipulate it. What they didn't know was they were watching a recording of the previous people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even there. It was just a recording. So they focused on it, thinking that they were going to move and change this laser beam. So they did that. They went back in and checked the recording and it changed. Mm -hmm. They'd gone, the only way it could have happened was they went back in time and they re yeah. 
manipulated the laser beam. It's the only explanation, and and that happens. This is a, mm -hmm. this is an experiment. Don't have their head around it yet, but what I'm getting at there is time is a very very strange thing. Mm -hmm. It's like rubber. It can bend, twist, stretch, extend, and snap. Mm -hmm. I'm not so, even surprised. This is, makes so much sense. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. that's it, really. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Yeah. Simple, you know, it's <laughs> simple to say. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to be an electron to get your head around it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, incredible. Oh my God. I could go into this time thing that again too now, but but I'm I'm gonna save that for next time. Okay, my next question. About, I don't know if that's a proper term, out of body experiences. I don't know if that's a proper term. But so I know that a lot of people are interested in that. And what happened to me sometimes is that I think three times, two times I know for sure, but I have a feeling there was a third time, where not even in meditation or something. One time, for example, I was sitting at the ocean and I felt this feeling as if I'm about from here to plop out of my body, but I got so scared because I thought I'm going to die. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I got so scared I was like, ah! and I just stayed in my body and it still blew my mind and it was incredible. But then later on, I thought, man, I should have just let it happen. But every time mm -hmm. this feeling came up, I got really scared. Can you speak on that or... Uh, should we try things like that? I know a lot of people are interested in this out-of-body experience stuff. And, and yeah, what do you think about that? And what is it are about that? Um, no, I'm not really scared then of that. Yeah, I, I tell you why. Because at that time, I was really sick. And that happened after I got healthy again. It was the first time I was out again. And I was in the United States. And it was the time of the corona also. And I really, really wanted to see my family again because I haven't seen them in 10 years. I was mm. all like, oh, it's all shits and giggles. It's okay if I don't see them. I'm going to see them one day. But then when I got sick, I was like, uh oh. And I, I really, that helped me also stay around because I almost died. And I wanted to see them again. And this is why, why I got scared and also Another uh, notion was that I felt like, oh, that's not the time to leave. <laughs> that's not, not yet. Hold on. This is too much fun right now. That's also the reason. But I'm not really scared of death. I used to be scared of how it's happening. But from all my research, I know that even that, uh, like you even said, we're probably going to faint or we just snap out before it even, if an accident happens, for example, we just snap out of the body before even. So I'm not even scared of the how anymore, really. So, but yeah, what do no, you think the death about room. You said what? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, let's, I was going to tell you about a death room. It, it's the most peaceful way a human being can die, and it's totally in your control. But mm -hmm. that wasn't your question. So we'll go into yeah. your question. And I, I heard about that. You were talking about that in, in uh, other interviews as well. Um, very interesting. And I'm going to get into this too about the praxis, practices that you did. Uh, I think three times a week, if I'm not wrong, or two times a week. I oh, the death practice. Been, yeah, that would have been the next question too. So yeah, it went, it was meant to be two times a week, but I did it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I got addicted to death. Gee, I where's can the imagine. That? Yeah, can you imagine. see, mm -hmm. your average person gets addicted to crack and heroin and shit <laughs> like that, but mystics again, they get addicted to death and shit. <laughs> I'm really not surprised. I really also oh, all the bad things. To die, I, need to <laughs> I need to die again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I forgot your question. Go on, let's do that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> the question was like <laughs> that <laughs> popping it, out it, it. feeling, that feeling of popping out of the body. And and well, what yeah, is going it. on there? Why does it happen? You were in the same position as people on death row. Yeah, that's a horrible statement to make, but you'll understand why in a second. You were trapped. You had a need to be with family. You had a need to be out of the situ situation you were in, and fear was involved, which drives the need even more. Magic, out-of-body experiences happen a 100 times quicker when the need 
is the driving force. When you want something, you're going to have to wait 28 days-ish. Want is different. Want is from the ego. Need is from the spirit. You needed to be with your family. And that was enough. You were trapped. There was something that you needed to do and you were unable to do it at that moment. You were trapped. And that is enough for your brain to go, you know what, I'm out of here, and it'll start to release. But the ego goes, what's going on? And that's enough to pull you back. Mm -hmm. Many, many people on death row, no spirituality whatsoever. That's why most of them are on death row. <laughs> but anyway, no spirituality whatsoever, uh, full of hatred, full of anger, full of confusion and all of those things. However, as soon as they start to feel the pressure of death row, the pressure of being in a box 24-7, the pressure of not knowing when your time is going to be up, having absolutely no control over life, they automatically start to astral journey out of their bodies, out of pure need. Uh, it ha it's very common. Mm -hmm. One very, uh, very, what's the word I'm looking for, a uh, very in inconvenient moment for me. I'd been riding my motorcycle. I'd, I'd ridden 2,000 kilometres in Australia through the desert and I was on my motorcycle and it was about 1 a.m. in the morning and it was a full moon and I was tired. I was so tired. It was ridiculous. And I dozed off and I saw my back and the back of my motorcycle riding off in front of me and I was just floating on the road and I could see my body on the thing and the bike started to do this mm -hmm. and I went straight back into the body and just corrected the bike. That was that was a uh, uncontrolled astral spurt. Mm -hmm. Happens a lot. Uh, some sometimes what we call um, an extremely vivid or lucid dream is actually an astral, an uncontrolled astral journey. Mm -hmm. If you have fear of these things, you need to know why. If you're not scared of death, then generally, from my experience, once someone has died and come back and died and come back under full control, and there is no longer any fear of death, there is nothing left to fear ever at all mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter what's happening to you you say to yourself what's the worst thing that can happen or you could die yeah that doesn't bother me so what are you scared of then mm -hmm. it has to be fear of embarrassment fear of doing the wrong thing fear of reprisal fear you gotta look at it where's that fear coming from mm -hmm. because it's a serious thing fear if you have fear it will stop you from doing a million things yes any animal in the world, when fear comes upon an animal, any any creature on the planet, when fear comes upon it, it does that. Mm -hmm. Shrink, hide, disappear, become invisible until the threat has gone mm -hmm. by. And that's what our ego does to us as soon as there's fear. Mm -hmm. So you need to find out where that comes from. Yes, I did ask myself that many times. I think it's also... And what did yourself say to you? Sorry? And what did yourself answer to you? Yeah, thank you. He said that very well. I think fear of the unknown also. Be that's why I'm asking you these questions too, because uh, I think when there's control over it and you know what you're doing, then uh, it's a little bit better. I have oh, a very yeah. good, a good friend of my, my family friend. She is, I would say, an enlightened person. She's been meditating for many, many years. She's a Buddhist, very strict on, on Buddhism. And she experienced that many times that she would hover above her body. Sometimes last time we spoke, she told me she didn't even know how to go back into it for a while and, and came back into her body, but she's not scared at all. And uh, that's also why I was asking what, what you think about that. And uh, because if I would know how to do it, I would probably do it more often <laughs> just because it's so interesting. And also in, in the hopes that if somebody has these questions that I maybe can answer something. You want to be able to astral journey more, easier? Is that what you're saying? You said what? Are you saying that you want to be able to astral journey more? Is that what you say when you yes. know? When you know? Yeah, oh, that's easy. Mm -hmm. All you do is Ooh. when you relax your body and focus your mind, you have just created the platform for 
everything from magical workings to remote viewing to astral journeying to moving into your next life. When you focus your mind and everything else is relaxed, magic happens. Mm -hmm. And I mean your brain is relaxed, your body is relaxed. That's all that it takes. Hypnosis. When you put someone under hypnosis, they can do incredible things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things that a normal human being can't do in a waking state. And all you do is you relax their body, put the body to sleep, keep the mind focused, and suddenly they can, you can put someone, a woman's head on a chair and put her feet on another chair and have a full grown, huge yeah. man standing on her belly and she will not bend. Mm -hmm. That's under hypnosis. And all you've done is focused her mind and relaxed her body and told her to do something and they just do it. You can do that without having to go under hypnosis. That's what the desensitization exercise is all about. So you do that. You relax your body, you focus your mind, and then you tell your brain what you want it to do for you, and that's where visualization comes in. And all you have to do is you lay on your bed, imagine yourself getting out of your body and moving around your bedroom. Don't just get up and move into the bedroom. Look at the chair, look at the lamp, look at the... the, the um, the patterns in the carpet or the lino, look at every detail of your bedroom and then walk into the hall, walk around your house, take an hour mm -hmm. and explore your house. And then at some point in that visualisation, keeping in mind that visualisation is actually telling your brain what you want it to do for you, at some point in that visualisation, it might not be the first night, it not, might not be the second, but very quickly, you get this feeling. You know this feeling that every human has had where you're laying on the couch and you're all nice and relaxed and suddenly you go <laughs> and mm -hmm. everyone in the room jumps, but to yeah. you, you feel like you're just about to fall. Yeah. But it yeah. actually feels like you've gone bang and come mm -hmm. back into your body. That's what it feels like. So what will happen is you'll be walking around your house and you'll feel this doom, and you realise that the imagination has stopped probably two or three minutes ago, and you are actually moving around your home. To test it, you just create the intent to rise above your home. Mm -hmm. And you'll boom, you'll be there like that. And you go, okay. And then you realize you're actually doing it now. That's all there is to it. You just keep doing that and it happens. And then, of course, you go out of your home and everything else. Don't believe all this bullshit that is bad for you because it's not. Don't mm -hmm. believe all the crap that someone will take over your body when you're out of it because that's not possible while you are connected. It is not possible. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get into someone else's body is if they have vacated it, and mm -hmm. that's in some rare, um, what's it called? Sorry, I'm a bit blank today. Um, coma. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. rare coma victims. Their brain is fine. Their body is fine. Everything's working. It's a brand new, really good body, but there's just no one home. There's no brain activity. There's nobody there. That's that's a spare vehicle. That's a second-hand car that you can go and mm -hmm. claim. Rare. I don't wow. know how I got onto that, but that's how you can astral journey anyway. You just keep doing it, visualizing it, and your body, your brain will eventually manifest it for you. And then you can go out of, you can start to go away from um, familiar areas like your house. You can then go and start to explore other places. There's no point in astraling if you're not prepared to explore new things. What's the bloody point? So, you know, go to the moon, go to Mars, mm -hmm. go to another galaxy, go and have a look at what's on the other end of a black hole. That's very possible and doable. You'd be amazed. Mm -hmm. There's 11... There's more, but we'll say 11 for now because that's what people have got their heads around. There's 11 different uh, dimensions that are responsible for this dimension being the way it is. And there are entities and beings that live on those dimensions as well. Sometimes they will cross over and you will see them as spirits or ghosts or just some strange shadow creature. And occasionally they see us as well in their dimension. And to them, we seem like ghosts occasionally. This is just as nature moves and time moves and crosses over, different dimensions get little snippets of each other. Um, 
And that happens all the time, especially with children. So there's black holes in this dimension and you can use those to travel through into other dimensions, but there's also black holes in other dimensions as well. Uh, so you can travel between each one. That's not an issue at all. I'm talking like you can just, you know, get up in the morning, eat your cocoa pops and go off and do this stuff. This is quite advanced, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, this is. is the best yeah. interview I've seen so far. Really, like this is you just all this, the stuff you said is what I wanted to hear in all the other interviews that I was listening to that you were in. That is incredible. Thank you for this sharing. is why I was really happy that you are doing this interview because you you know me on a personal level you you do you're a do you anyway do you mind me saying that you're a student of mine totally totally fine yeah excellent because you're a student of mine and because you're very good at what you do and you advance very quickly you know what questions to ask mm -hmm. and I'm I, this is why I've looked forward to this so much mm -hmm. so Let's go. Yes, very, very awesome. I must say that just made my day again because uh, I've been, I'm really been doing this visualization with walking around a long time already. For me, that's pretty easy. I just never knew that there can be a further step to it, right? This is, I noticed this is like a theme where we talk about something and I'm like, oh, I was so close to something. And then I was like, okay, that's it. That's it, right? And, uh, also, as when I was younger, I have not heard this anywhere. I was just doing that. I would always jump out of my body. Uh, and uh, for example, at one time, I had a bus ride when I lived in LA, uh, one and a half hour bus ride, and it was a lot of crazy people in there. And I would just close my eyes and I would go <laughs> out of the earth, right? And I would hover over the earth and send so much love to the planet, right? I would just send so much love down and I would feel like a superhero. Like I would just charge myself up <laughs> with energy. And I thought, okay, that's just in my mind, but I thought something great. And a lot of times when I opened my eyes, the most people around me were just like this too. I was like, okay, I did something. <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. I have to relax everybody. Yeah. So for me, that's a really easy task. So good to know that there's a, it can be more than that. When you change your state of mind, everyone else around you gets affected, including animals. That's mm -hmm. a fact. I'll tell you a story. Then the, when the Chinese went in to take out the Dalai Lama in his palace, before they went in there to actually get him, they spent the night outside of the palace and they set up camp. So he was totally surrounded. And um, they were going to go in the next morning and take out the palace with the Dalai Lama and everyone inside. So that night, the Dalai Lama and about 50 of his monks all went into deep theta meditation and the whole Chinese army fell asleep and they just walked through, <laughs> stepped over the bodies, walked through and went to India. Yes, I can totally imagine. Ooh, that's brilliant. That is so good. Yeah. It's easy to do and that's that's we all do it. Children can do it. And mm -hmm. uh, as you, a lot of things that you've been saying, uh, most kids have experienced most of the things that you've talked about in your childhood. But it, of course, it gets knocked out of you mm -hmm. by the time you're a young teenager. By the time you get to high school, you are um, not not everyone, but majorly most people are ready and ripe to become society fodder. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is you, when you get educated, you're basically educated to play some part in the maintenance of society. That's mm -hmm. it. You're either going to learn to sweep streets or make streets, clean buildings or make buildings, uh, work in an education department or build an education, something. You're going to be cleaning windows, building cars, making roads, building houses. You're going to be doing something of that nature. And you may even get a job whereby you start to prepare the next generation to become society fodder, in which case you're a school teacher. Mm. And, of course, there are options if you are smart enough and if you the opportunity comes your way and if luck is on your side, you'll be presented with other options to your regular society fodder 
education mm. and you know you might be lucky enough to see something a movie or read a book or something that's going to blow you out and you go what the hell is that all about and you start looking into it if you're lucky enough to be really fascinated by some of the little things that happen to you like the things that you do you did on the bus and the things that we see as children that unfortunately parents and this isn't their fault by any means as soon as a parent says to a child that's just your imagination mm. you've destroyed that child's life oh you've i heard that all the time i just had this weird luck that i'm a very stubborn person and i just knew i knew that what i felt or what i saw was a real, real thing especially because i could prove it for example mm. as a child Uh, I knew all when there were uh, people visiting my parents, I always knew this person is cheating on that person, this person is lying about that, but that's not something you can prove. But there were other things, my sensibilities that were really, I could prove. For example, I was always able to touch dishes in friends' houses, and I knew with which side of the sponge they were cleaned. I don't know what that's all about, but just like I had this sensitivity that I would play with. And again, I thought everybody could do that, right? Which was turned yeah. out to not be true. They, they thought I'm crazy. And then also my parents, ah, even though my father was, I think, a mystic himself a little bit. Later it changed. He became very bitter and uh, somewhat narcissistic, <laughs> really. Uh, but uh, in, he think, I think he probably opened that up in me when I was really, really small. But then he started mm -hmm. evaluating any everything, but I was really stubborn. I just did not, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I know what I saw, I know what's going on, so I never really gave up. But that also brings me to another question, which wasn't even written in here, but you just, uh, this conversation just brought me to this. Um, I don't know if this is going to help somebody else or somebody really experienced that too, but I'm just going to put it out there. When I was 18, I think 18, One time I sat there and then I thought, you know, I always did these beginner meditations. I didn't even know what I was doing. So I sat there and I just imagined a light or like an energy ray going into the small, from like my heart space somewhere, into the smallest, small, smallest parts because it never ends. I'm pretty sure it's, there's always a smaller thing and it's endless. And then at the same time, I sent it out forever just like forever forever and the beginning was really hard to even feel that but then all of a sudden this happened uh, <laughs> this weird thing happened where oh uh, and then i stopped it and i was blown away and i always use this specifically to send it out or to just i don't even know how to put this in words to just um sense the endlessness of everything The infinity and that gives me like a really beautiful boost of energy but can you explain yeah. what this was do you have any idea of what this was? this weird yeah, you, you were touching this name for it you were touching on what's called ain sofor which comes from the kabbalah the khabla. okay or if you're from australia kabbalah <laughs> 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 Or like uh, like me from Germany, Kabbalah. <laughs> Kabbalah, yeah, yeah. Kabbalah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Germany at the end of the week. Anyway, <laughs> there's a thing in the Kabbalistic. This is Kabbalistic mysticism, Kabbalistic tree. I'm and flying to Germany the... too on Friday. Oh, I might see you there. Yeah, just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Somewhere. you never know. It's a small place. <laughs> 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 I forgot what I was saying now. Where was I? Uh, about the Kabbalistic, I can't... Oh, the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life. <laughs> there, it's very... Mis yeah, it, it, it aligns you and tunes you into the universe when you do it correctly. There is a... Um, there is a, it's a very, very small ritual called the Kabbalistic cross. And I'm not going to do the whole thing, but you got to get to... <clears throat> You got to get it about. Yeah, you got to get it about there where I was just then. Mm -hmm. All right. Now 
you can't feel it, but my chest is vibrating, which mm-hmm. means the air is being pumped in here, and that's how you affect things through vibration. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, part of this small ritual is a day. And what that does, you are visualizing a white light, lineal form, coming from eternity below you, coming through your body to eternity above you. And I don't know how much you can see. And you're also imagining a white light coming from eternally to the right all the way through your body and crossing this other Mm -hmm. one in the middle of your heart, going to eternity the other way. So you've got this cross going through you eternally in every direction. And that brings you. So when you're doing it, the visualization is very, very dramatic. It's like... uh, So you put everything into it and you see it and you feel it. And when you hold that enough, the energy of the universe is already in you or you'd be dead, but you get a much, much bigger gamut of it. And it's like, and that's what you were doing, but you're only using one line. Still thing, you still get the same shudder. Mm -hmm. Um, and the four are the ingredients that make up consciousness or God if you're a religious person. Wow. You can go way beyond that just God. Blew my mind. Cool. This is incredible. You this is the best. You might want to wipe that off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> is that a little bit of your brain dribbling down the wall there? <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is so amazing. I, I thank you so much for your answers. This is the best interview ever, really. This is what I always wished for in all of the interviews. This is so great. Okay. Now, I have, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking which questions are also still important and, and which ones could, could help. Um, okay. One more. Because we're speaking about, we were speaking about the near-death experience, or if that's how you call it, experiencing death or being out of the body with your certain rituals that you did. I'm not even going to let you explain this because I am actually going to tag all the Matrix Wissen, uh, the the interviews under this channel so people can see that you don't have to repeat yourself because everybody asks you the same questions. I'm wondering how you're not like, oh my God, again. But um, the first time we met... I do do that. Yeah. I can imagine. Nobody yeah. asked me the right questions. Nobody asked me the right questions at all, really. Anyway, go on. Mm-hmm. You, you've asked some good ones, the better ones, yeah. Good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, so the first time we met, you said that you see, um, I'm putting this, I don't want to say spirits because people have probably some type of connection to that word. You see beings. Let's put it like that, for lack of better words, all the time. First of all, what do you see? And also, is that because, is that an effect of or a consequence of the death practices? No. No? Mm -hmm. Next question. (laughs) What do you see? I'm I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be fine. <laughs> this is an easy one. Are you ready? Yes. How do you see your thoughts? Yeah. It's pitch black in that head of yours. Mm-hmm. Pitch black. There's yeah. no light in there. It's full of fat and blood. Lovely. <laughs> mm-hmm. How are you seeing in there? How do you see a picture? How do you see your thoughts? Yeah. That's what you call your third eye. Okay. Let's go through this bit again. I know you know this. These eyes can only see things that block sunlight. Mm. Okay. Sun hits the tree, bounces off the tree, goes into these eyes. Now you can see the tree. It can't see anything that light goes through. 
because there'd be no light bouncing off it and you wouldn't be able to see it. Very, very limited. Also, there's 100 million colours out there and we've got the ability to see, ooh, three, maybe seven. Mm -hmm. And they're all made up. Anyway, we don't see very many of them. So we're very, very limited as far as that's concerned. Go into the third eye. You've got this in, in you've got this thing in here that can see pitch black. It can see, it can visualize a sun so bright you would squint. Mm, yes. You can yeah. visualize uh, what's his name Nikolai Tesla. He would visualize an engine and trace around it on a piece of paper. He just visualize it and trace around it like like a template. Mm -hmm. And then he would start it up in his head and it would go. Dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug. If there was a cog or a screw or anything out of place, it wouldn't work. So he would change it until it does work. And then when it works, he builds it and it works because he's that's how good he was. Not the point, though. The point is when you do the right exercise, this part of your mind that can see in pitch black, can see electrical impulses, can see things that these eyes are never going to be able to see. You can expand it outside of the skull. Mm -hmm. You know, there's ancient paintings, Leonardo da Vinci paintings with people with halos around their head. They're not angels. They're people who have expanded their inner sight. Mm -hmm. Once you expand it outside of your head, now you can see things out here that these eyes can't see out here. Mm -hmm. They're always there. They've always been there. A lot of them can't see you, but you can see them. And that, that's all you do. It's got nothing to do with the death practice. It's all about use your third eye. Let me back up a little bit. If you want to build, build up your bicep, you do bicep curls uh, until it's the size you want it to be and until it's as strong as you want it to be. If you want to build up your third eye, it's not a very good word. It's not a third eye. It's an inner sight. But anyway, if you want to build that up to the point where it comes beyond the skull, you just start using it and it'll, it'll just grow. It'll get bigger mm -hmm. and bigger and better and better and it'll become the dominant site as opposed to these guys. <clears throat> I see it all the time. The entities you see, some look humanoid, some are just vapors. You would just think uh, it's a vapor. Someone's boiled a jug and there's some steam. But what you notice is if you try communicate with it it stops in midair and it turns towards you it doesn't turn with the face it just does this and it knows you know that it is aware of your presence and it's aware that you are aware of its presence and then it moves on it's not going to try and talk to you in the same way if you go scuba diving you're not going to try and talk to a groper mm -hmm. you're just going to be there fascinated by it you know it's no different actually when you dive in, if you've never dived into the ocean ever in your entire life and you do so for the first time let's say on the um barrier reef the great barrier reef in australia you're going to be am amazed you won't be able to speak because you're underwater <laughs> but you won't be able to speak about what you're down there for you'll be in the water and you just you have epiphanies it's incredible Anyone that's been scuba diving will know exactly what I'm talking about. You you feel like you're in someone else's lounge room. Mm -hmm. There are moments where when I was doing it, I, I got my dive masters in, in Queensland in Australia so I could take 30 people down there to do diving. Wow. That's one of the ways I earned money to go back to Tibet. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where I was maybe, I don't know, five metres from the top swimming and there was a fish below me about that wide and about that long and I was just floating above it and it stopped and it rolled over onto its side and it looked up at me for a moment and I had a I I had a realization I had an experience at that point I'm in this guy's home and he's just become aware of me and he's rolled over and he's scoping me out mm -hmm. I'm thinking Whoa, you know, because it wasn't a human being, it was another creature. I was quite young when this happened, it was gorgeous. But anyway, I'm off track. That's what it's like when your third eye, when your inner sight comes out of your skull, it's like diving into the barrier reef. There are creatures and entities that will look at you, they'll check you out, they won't communicate with you. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's it takes a few years to get used to it. 
I don't even know what you asked me, but that no. sounded pretty good. What just yeah, came yeah, out yeah. of my face? I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> you, said, you know the answer to question. Uh, and, and what about what about when you said earlier angels, when you said uh, depending on how many angels are around? Um, what what how angels are people play? that have the, yeah. people are angels that have the ability to <clears throat> bring certain ingredients into your life that is necessary for your forward development. So and it's objectives true. in life. Mm -hmm. So it is true. Yeah. Yeah. I've had many experiences like yeah, that. Yeah, but it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, everyone does. It's 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 like you know, if just watch it, clear everything off your plate as a magician and as a mystic. Clear everything off. You got no works in the astral. You got no works in your brain. You got nothing happening in your laboratory. You're clean and you're in a neutral position right now. And then think to yourself, I'm going to manifest a flower pot mm -hmm. with a rose in it. Let's do that one. Do whatever it is, whatever technique you're going to use to make this thing occur. And then watch what happens. Go to your local shop. Just do everything you would normally do in your normal life, but be watching out for your angels. And it might be as simple as this. You might go to the local shop. There might be someone in that shop who has just bought a flower pot, but it has no rose in it, but it looks like the flower pot that you were visualizing. You go, that's interesting. There's my flower pot. Probably, perhaps I didn't visualize properly enough because I'm seeing it in someone else's hands. I actually wanted it myself. Mm -hmm. While you're thinking that or while your ego is thinking that, a bus might pull up out the front. Someone might shout out the window, quick, 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 Bob, you're going to miss your bus. Bob puts his flower pot down and goes, ah, and runs and gets on the bus and they've gone. Now there's a flower pot sitting there. Mm -hmm. That one must be it. So you grab the flower pot on the way home. Some guy you've never met in your life, but he's seen you getting on and off of this bus for 10 years now, and he runs up to you and he just gives you a rose because he's been secretly in love with you for five years. Mm -hmm. What do you got in your hand when you get home? you got your flower pot and you've got a rose in it, and it came from two different angels that you've never met in your entire life, and they just came to your life and left, and you've ended up with that. And that's how it works every single time yeah. in different variations and different ways. Your angels are the people. If you mag want to magically create a new pair of shoes, you're not going to get an angel to leave heaven, come flying down to earth just to give you a pair of shoes when there just happens to be a shoe shop two blocks down from where you live. They're just going to encourage someone to give you a pair of shoes somehow, you know. People, really easy one, take all of humanity off of this planet where would you find good and evil? Where would you find demons and angels? Mm. Where would you find religion and all stupid things like that? You just took it all off the planet. Mm. There's no evil on this planet outside of us. And evil is a bad word. It's just not what we are. We Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Oh, no, you're, you, this is so perfect, everything you say, because it always goes into the next questions. It's It's almost like... You're seeing what's written here, <laughs> which I wouldn't be surprised if you would. But um, yeah, very, very, very good because, okay, first of all, I know the time is going away. We have a couple of minutes left. Oh, I, really? Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking which is the most important question for people. Um, and I'm guessing since you already segue into it, I'm going to just go there. Uh, because I also know, <laughs> I also know that uh, people that feel similar like me struggle with the similar things. And you actually already answered me that, but I want people to that watch that video to really get something out of it. So we're basically speaking about the marketplace. When uh, when you let's call it enlightened, okay, for lack of better words, when you're a little bit on the side of enlightenment and you speaking woken with, up you said what 
Woken up. Woken it's, up. It's yeah. equivalent. It's like waking up out of a dream. Yes, it really is like Literally, a dream. That's what it's like. yeah. yeah. And then anyway. you speaking with people. I must admit, it still happens to me today, and I'm not saying this out of a victim type of view, not at all. I don't feel like a victim of anything, honestly. Um, but I am playing a fake role a lot of times because I don't want to come off cocky and uh, I don't want to sound super smart all the time. And I know it can get on people's nerves. And I also know from myself that when I'm in my ego and I'm struggling and It used to be that way, not anymore. But then when somebody comes and talks smart at you, it's like, yeah, right, you don't know how it is or something like that. I love when people tell me, when people wake me up, when I'm in my ego, I love that. But I know that it's not for everybody. And these conversations that become really, say, boring. And then I play really a fake role because I engage with it because I don't want to just sit there and be quiet. And then, for example, people are complaining and then I say, yeah, I understand, even though I don't understand. Because, for example, I love everybody, even the murderers. Sorry, now people are going to probably hate me when I say that, especially when things are happening in the world. But it's always a, a careful one to sit, I have to be careful to say that. But Unconditional I, love is unconditional love. There's nothing you can do about that. If yeah. you have unconditional love, it doesn't matter what, whether it's a murderer or whether it's a puppy. Unconditional mm. means unconditional. You love them regardless. Yes. And I know I'm not going to talk all smart and say if somebody would murder my loved one that I would immediately re realize it. But who knows? Maybe I would realize it immediately. But I know for certain that I wouldn't go into hatred. That's not gonna gonna be the thing. But anyway, where I'm getting at is that I'm playing a fake role and I know that a lot of people have asked you that too and, and they have this similar feeling that you are around people and then in my case, for example, they complain about something, he did this and he did this and this is so annoying, this is so annoying. And then you sit there and then I wanna really help so much to the point where I used to get on people's nerves really, really bad. <laughs> I got people's nerves so bad that I also noticed that was also the ego. And I stopped with everything because uh, trying to convince people is also super egotistical. And then uh, mm. I don't know if, if playing a fake role and playing along with it is a good thing to do or if I should just stay... Um, on the other side of it. And even if I don't say anything, basically the question is how can I help people better? <laughs> this, is the, this is the question when, when I'm around people and I just want to have a good influence on them. And uh, this fake role feels also a little bit weird. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should just play this fake role because it feels better for the people. It doesn't bother me. I'm not just, I'm not crying over it. Or again, I'm not feeling like a victim. But do you have any advice about that? When you're in the marketplace, how to deal with the marketplace? <laughs> the best teacher in the world is a living example. Mm -hmm. Anything else is a religion. Mm -hmm. You work on yourself. You become better and better, more and more still, stronger and stronger. You become the best you can possibly be. That's all you need to do because people are watching. If you get yourself to a certain point of self-mastery, people will look at you and go, I want to be like her. She's calm. She's always smiling. She's always pleasant. She never has a bad word to say about anything or anyone. She's full of love. Whenever there's a crisis and everyone's running around like absolute dickheads, she's the only one that is standing strong as a rock in the middle of it all, looking for the best way out of the situation for everyone. I want to be like her. Mm. That's how you teach. Yeah. Because That's then funny. they will ask you, how do you do that? How can you stand there with all of these dickheads running around sh spewing obscenities at each other and you, you're untouched, you're unbothered. It, it's like water off a duck's back. How do you do that? Mm. And then you're going to tell them, well, I wasn't born like that. I, I take it 
takes work, takes effort. It's not difficult. It just takes a little a bit of time is all, but you can do it. And that's it. It's otherwise, rare that people ask that. Otherwise, you are interfering. Yes. Yeah. Interfering. Exactly. I feel it deep inside. That's not where it's at. I feel when it. people are ready, when people are discontent, they start looking. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be talking to me if you were absolutely content. And I might be using the, the wrong word with you, the, the wrong person here. But if someone is absolutely content in their life, they're not going to talk to me. They're not going to go and talk to their preacher. They're, not, they, they're fine. They're content. They're not looking mm -hmm. for anything. Why would they if you're absolutely mm -hmm. content? But not everyone. Most people are not content. And they're looking for meaning. They're looking for hope. They're looking for the end of their confusion. They're looking for what to do next in life in a good, positive way that's going to help the betterment of life for everyone around. They're going to start looking. How do I do this? How do I better my life? How, how do I get rid of this discontentment? So what do you do? You go looking for people that are absolutely content. You look for people who are unmoved. And this is the answer to a previous question of yours. Your average fool, your average fool, F-O-O-L, will spend several lifetimes trying to get rid of everything that annoys them, trying to knock on the head everything that annoys them, try to distract themselves from everything that annoys them, including their own thoughts and their own emotions. If their own thoughts and emotions annoy them, they'll take drugs and numb themselves to themselves. They will take alcohol, they will distract themselves with a hundred million things just to get away from the things that annoy them. An intelligent spiritual warrior will train themselves not to be annoyed. It's so much easier. Mm. And you stay out of jail that way too. Mm. The yeah. best place to practice is in here. The most annoying things in your life is between your ears. Mm. So you go in there with meditation and you train yourself not to be moved by all the stupid bullshit that's going on inside your head. Let it all go on, but do not be moved by it. And when you're really good at that, you bring that skill into the outside world and then nothing out here will bother you. If the bullshit you got in here doesn't bother you anymore, then the stuff out here certainly isn't going to bother you because mm. you can't walk away from this. It's with you all the time. It's the main factor. Stuff out here, you can just walk away from it, but you won't anymore because you've trained yourself not to be bothered. That's the rationality of it. Yeah. How many people in the world run around getting rid of races of people that annoy them, getting rid of, you see what I mean? Animals that annoy them, insects that annoy them, murder, 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 you annoy me, murder, murder, you annoy me, you annoy me, bang, bang. Mm -hmm disgusting creatures however we have the ability to step out of the creature that we are that we inhabit a well, creature, i'm, I'm guilty know. of the i'm guilty of the thing with the bugs I, I had actually a big question about that but i know the time is running out we're gonna have to do this again well, let's do another one of these get another list of questions and let's have another interview because yeah. your questions are the questions of a student and there are people out there who are going to want to know the answers to these kind of questions mm. i think you've done a remarkable job jules well done Thank you. Very glad to hear this. One last question. Would you be open to do some experiments maybe together for in interviews like that? Similar yeah, like with yeah. Oliver? Absolutely. Like what? I, let me back up. I don't know. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> you totally get it. Because I remember what really convinced me was when he did this experiment with the number, random number generator. Probably remember that. Oh, with Oliver. Yeah, that was for me. That was sold, right? That this is this is there's something going on. Things along those lines. I haven't really talked uh, thought about this because I haven't asked you the question. If that's okay, but um, if you're open for it, I would think yeah, about some things, or yeah. maybe you have some ideas too. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. let me have a think about it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you, can I ask you a question? 
Yes, please. Apparently, we, I've, I've been getting a lot of emails from people in Russia who have seen my stuff in Russia. Now, I didn't know I had anything in Russia, and I can't for the life of me find out what people are watching. I got we got Russians getting in touch with us left, right, and center, and I love it. Yeah, I love Russians. I, I want to have stuff over there. I'm so happy that they're interested in my stuff, but I don't know what it is they're watching. So if anyone out there has a link, it's uh, there's a there's a TV station in Russia called shit. No, that's not what it's called. Um, Shadow <laughs> Shadow Control. It's called. Shadow it? control. And, yeah, and it, it's a bunch of people. I think they got scientists in there as well, and they absolutely, totally, one hundred percent are looking at and uh, investigating and analysing magic or psychic abilities, all of the chitas that people train for. Um, and it's it's all documented, it's all demonstrated, and it's quite good. But anyway, they did a very, very long interview with me quite some years ago, and I never knew what came of it. And I'm thinking that must be what people are watching, but I can't find it. So mm -hmm. if anyone out there has got the link, I would really, really love to get it, and I would thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, please find the link, guys. You're really, really good with that. So... Thank you so much, DM. I appreciate you with all of my heart. This was the best interview. That was exactly the interview I always wish to see. And I am going to definitely schedule another one. And I'm going to schedule for uh, our class. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye here to my viewers and then probably say goodbye to you afterwards. Bye. Have a blessed now. Bye, everybody. That was already it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check the links. There's awesome stuff to discover. And as always, much love to everyone. Stay focused and have a blessed now, since that's all there is. Mm -hmm.